Can you kind of break down the difference for people who aren't familiar with apprenticeships programs and oh, how sure. those work? We hire them. They get paid at this point, a minimum of 18 to $20 an hour. Once they get hired, the first thing they do is go through our bootcamp curriculum. So they're getting paid to go through something that normally costs $15,000 and we don't charge anything for it. Then there's no weird contracts where we're like, you have to work with for us for two years and then you got to work at this employer. There's none of that. It's just, we trust and invest in somebody, give them three to four months of training first, and then place them embedded inside a uh, engineering team. We do all of the career services and sort of like match them up with employers. And then most of the employers will make a hiring decision to bring that person on. What is the typical salary that you've seen people make after they've left your apprenticeship program? Last year was averaging around 67 and this year is averaging closer to around 77 in that range. Hello, what's up, everybody? My name is Andrew Baines. My co-host, Eli, won't be able to join me today, but we still have another great episode planned for you on the Custom Journeys podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be interviewing Mike Roberts. He's the CEO of Creating Coding Careers, an apprenticeship program that's committed to increasing diversity in tech. So really interested and excited to talk to him today about how he's helping fill the pipeline of um, diverse tech candidates and helping solve the problems of diversity in STEM. Mike, how you doing today? Great. Excited. Awesome. Thanks for taking time out for me. So, man, you I'm really excited to talk to you and some others that have really taken an interest and a passion into solving this problem with having uh, enough people that are trained and skilled in the tech uh, industry. And not only that, but really focusing on how to make tech more diverse. We're going to spend most of this episode talking about creating coding careers or CCC. But before we get there, I first want to start by learning a little bit more about you. So I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you have a bachelor's in, um, what is it? Business administration. Is that correct? Computer engineering. So I think it's, uh, information systems. It's been a long time. So. Okay. 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 Gotcha. Yeah. I think on LinkedIn, it said business administration. So thanks for correcting me on that. So what was kind of your journey to tech in anyway? Like what first got you interested in STEM or, or pursuing a tech career? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So I did start at San Diego state as a business major yeah. and, uh, I transitioned eventually I was on like the 10 year plan in college. <laughs> so, um, having a family where both my parents were educators was really important to them that I went to college. And so they kind of didn't give me the greatest advice at that time. Cause you know, this is back in like 94 and I don't think people thought of software engineering as the career path that they think of it as today. And so, um, I was not encouraged. I was told like, you know, it goes to college for programming. So you have to pay something else. And so I was like, I'm about, I like business. And then it was like, all right, well, uh, accounting. And my dad was like, yeah, well, that's good. Accounting can get some, get a good job there. And I was like, all right. <laughs> Needless to say, you spent the first couple of years, you know, living on campus. Then the second couple of years commuting the campus. And then the fifth and sixth year, uh, kind of just trying to discover and figure out myself. And so it just took a really long time for me to work through and identify that software engineering was the right thing, but I had been doing it for a really long time. I had been doing it since I was a teenager. So since I was a kid, I had been interested in it and I was able to use even like our first home computer, you could, you turn it on and you could write little programs at the command line. So I was super interested in it because you could spend hours and didn't, it wasn't very expensive. So, you know, we didn't have a lot, you know, middle-class family, mm -hmm. uh, living in suburbs. And so it was just a great way for me to entertain myself and, you know, was super curious about how it worked and what, what I could build with it. And so that eventually materialized into a career in tech, but it took much, much longer than the, than I think it should have. Uh, along the way, I got to do lots of, you know, other fun things, but this was something I was always drawn back to regardless of whatever the other job that I was working, I was always drawn back to like, man, I wish there's some way I could translate this into, you know, something more, something I could do more of. And then eventually I just figured out like, oh man, people would actually pay me to do this. And so I started kind of as a side hustle, putting together training content and building e learning modules. And then that side hustle turned into like full-time enterprise. And so my career kind of took off from there in terms of tech. Okay. Neat. So, um, 
parents give you advice to go major in accounting, you know, best in, they had your best interest at heart, um, but they weren't really aware that software engineering could be very lucrative. Um, and I guess that makes sense. You guys were at the beginning of like the tech boom, right? Yeah, um, sure. So what, uh, first, before we get into like your career after college, how did you actually pay for college at San Diego State? Oh, good question. Uh, student loans. So I took out student loans that I still have to this day. <laughs> really? Oh, man. Okay. I, I mean, I've deferred them for just about as long as I could. And not a significant amount. I mean, we certainly have a much larger you know, mortgage on the house. But it is one of those where it's just like, man, it's it's one of those things that's just never ending. Uh, it's been it's been nice to have a respite during the pandemic where there's like no yeah. being charged and they're just kind of marinating there. So, um, so I I did that. I took out some student loans and then I worked. I I worked the whole time that I was in in college, so it was not an easy experience. And that was also something that led to a lot of distractions, right? So I know there's a record behind you. So I was a DJ when I was in college and so oh. I actually DJ in Mexico, south of the border, there's a hip hop club down there. And so that was one of the many jobs that I did while I was going through college, which again, it, it afforded me, uh, I love music. So it afforded me an opportunity to do something I also really enjoyed, but it was by no means as easy or there were not as many opportunities as there are today for people that want to get into tech that don't have just a single lane that you can go through. I went through the longer, I would call it more of a self-taught uh, mechanism because from my perspective, even though I had my bachelor's degree in computer science, that wasn't what determined like I was going to get work and whatnot. It was, I had already established a business by then and I was already like doing it and heads down on it. So it, to me, it was just fulfilling my parents' wish that I get a degree, get a piece of paper. My grandfather's wish to like, you get your piece of paper, man. Like, they're doing. Gotcha. All right. So once you graduated with your computer science degree, I, I know you said you had started your own tech company. Um, what was like your first formal job that you had out of college and how did you land that job? Ooh. I'm going to take you I back. I don't remember exactly what I was doing when I graduated because when I finally finished and got my CS degree, I the way that I finished was actually unique. There was one... And there's probably several more, like now there's like Western Governors University and a bunch of other schools where you can yeah. take alternative classes or exams and get college credit for them. So at the time, that's actually how I finished my degree through Excelsior. So I started at San Diego State, but I finished through Excelsior College because they were accepting um, like CLEP tests and Dante tests. So that's a lot of the military folks know those. And they're like, oh, yeah, you can take a bunch of these tests and get college credit for each of these courses. So I took a few of those for courses that I was just missing that I needed to graduate. And then I took, uh, certification exams. So I got like my MCSE. So it's the Microsoft certified systems engineer. I got that in like 2000 and then, uh, or around that some, somewhere around that year, cause it was the 2000 version of windows. Um, and then I got a Cisco certification. I got an A plus certification a network plus a security plus. INET, like a bunch of certifications, Novell, for whatever reason, I thought Novell was going to be a thing. And then, um, what ended up happening was I could take most of those and transfer them to actual college credit at Excelsior and then be able to finish my degree. So I just remember at the time I was driving buses, so I know it seems super disconnected, but at the time I was driving these big tour buses and giving people tours of San Diego and, and Mexico and. I remember I would be, I'd park the bus and I'd study for tests while I was waiting for the, you know, folks were just like, you know, pouring around Tijuana, buying stuff, tchotchkes from shops. I'd be on the bus studying so I could pass another test and get that much closer to my degree. So once I finished that, I think I went into training and I started training mostly, um, there are a variety of different industries. And so that kind of led me to finally kind of make the two merged together. And that was like, I was doing some ed tech, uh, modules for people. That was my side hustle and that was a building business. And then I was really good at helping people to just digest content and create curriculum and build sort of like the modules and the programs themselves. And so the two of those merged together and then eventually went and worked at a couple of different startups after, after my business. Um, so. I could have continued to grow the business, but I was kind of, kind of burned out. It was a lot of like 
agency style work. Um, and so I sold that business, went and worked for uh, a couple startups and then eventually transitioned back out and in purely into training again when I went to work for Origin, which is the first yeah, people that I worked at. Okay, cool. So um, it's, it's a lot there I want to get into sure. real quick. So number one, I think it's awesome that you kind of said, hey, by any means necessary, right? If I got a DJ in Tijuana, if I got to ride tour buses, take out student loans, whatever the case is. So uh, I think that's awesome. I think that our listeners can really take a lot from that, that perseverance that you had to really go after what you wanted to achieve in life. And then also, I think it's cool how you kind of, I, I noticed in your story, like, you're always kind of leaning back into like the educational roots that you have, like your parents being educators. And so you're learning computer science and software engineering, but at the same time, you're always still having that like education mindset of like, Hey, how can I still educate others and help others along the way? So I just wanted to highlight those two points. I think that's an amazing uh, thing that you've done throughout your career that kind of leads into getting into creating coding careers. So can you kind of walk me through, you worked at startups, you built your own company, where did you get to the point where like, hey, I want to think about creating creating coding careers? Yeah, so creating coding careers was an outcrop out of, uh, well, at first, I guess to rewind, when I got the first, I took the first position as a, uh, I was technically the chief academic officer at Origin, and I was largely responsible for the classroom experience. So helping to make sure that students were um, getting through the material, learning what they needed to learn, but also sort of shaping the educational experience. They closed, and when they closed, I was not ready to just, like, give up on training people. I just invested so much time helping them get licensed and writing all this curriculum that I was like, how about if I just, like, started my own program? Like, maybe that's the better move than going back out into industry and just working on a startup again. So I started the San Diego Code School because I love San Diego, all right? And it, it felt like it was the natural extension of the work that I had been doing through um at origin so about a year or so into it i was like man i'm still having a lot of the same issues with the ability for us to attract and retain students as we're having with origin and so i was like we need to try something slightly different and we need to iterate on this model and that iteration became creating coding careers so we needed to be able to afford to hire the students because that was my grand scheme. My, my grand scheme was if I can hire these knuckleheads, maybe they'll listen to me. Right. And it would also allow them to be more distraction free. They wouldn't have to worry about working a part-time job and trying to work around the program. And instead it could just be the program. They could just be focused on the program for, for a year, give them a year of experience under their belt and they'll be awesome. We'll turn out the best students anywhere in the nation. So I was like, well, to make that happen, the biggest expense is going to be payroll. And this sounds like a social enterprise. So why don't we figure out a way that the biggest expense can be a nonprofit, can fall under a nonprofit. And so that was sort of the nexus of creating, creating coding careers. Like we need to have a nonprofit to be able to afford to make this program work because otherwise it's just unattainable for us to be able to just try and turn this on just under the entity that's a for-profit. It's possible, but I didn't have the the means to be able to go out and, or the patience to be able to spend a year, go out and raise a bunch in order to be able to afford to like, to make this happen. So the nonprofit was like the easiest thing to just like, okay, we'll do this as like a side thing. We'll figure out how to make it work. We'll try and raise some philanthropic funds to like seed it. And then we can start hiring people and giving them a, a much better experience. So it was kind of the start of creating funding careers. Okay. So let's, let's get into that a little deeper. So I'm, um, very familiar with coding boot camps. We've interviewed, um, teachers or instructors for coding boot camps as well as former students. Um, but some of our audience may not be. So I guess if we can kind of re rewind a little bit. So first you did San Diego coding school and that was like just purely a coding boot camp. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. In the state of California, it's, it's really tough to start a, a program. I don't think they like boot camps, uh, the state, the man. And so. Really? Um, we wanted to make sure we didn't break any of their rules. Cause that was one of the things that got origin in trouble is like the rules are just really hard to follow for a new enterprise. So we had to restrict the amount of tuition that we could charge. So we could only charge $2,500 in tuition. So we broke our program into two programs, front end program. And then we provided services for people that wanted to get a job right after the front end program and a back end program. 
which you could do after or you could do before the front end program. So in that way, we were able to charge a maximum amount of tuition of $5,000. But not everybody did both. You know, human beings, they're all yeah. they're cheap. They're like, oh, I'll just do the front end and I'll get a job. I'm like, bro, you should probably do the back end. Who gives? <laughs> but the idea was that we couldn't, like, we couldn't force them to do both. They had to be able to choose. And they, when they get to the end of the first one, they had to be able to choose if they want to go out in the industry or if they want to, you know, actually take the second half and be a little bit more polished for an opportunity. So, so that said, as I'm sure you know, five thousand dollars is a really inexpensive uh, in-person coding boot camp. Cheapest, cheapest I've ever heard. I know. So there were some people that were like balking at that. It was just like, amazing. I'm just like, yo, I'm gonna give you a front end boot camp for twenty five hundred bucks in person. Like we had, we had a classroom space. Like, yeah, shit instructors with like a ton of experience, and there were still people that were just ah, twenty five hundred dollars. Is there any way that like, I can like pay afterwards when I get a job? And I was like, no. I can't do that. <laughs> I don't have the capacity to do that. If I could, I would. So yeah, that was the start. Oh. That was kind of how we started. Okay. So originally you had the traditional coding boot camp mm -hmm. uh, model, extremely cheap for those watching. I mean, most of the coding boot camps I hear about are like 15,000. Yeah. So um, extremely cheap, about the third of the cost of a traditional boot camp. You said, Hey, that's not working. You're having issues in terms of retention and things of that nature. So you pivot to an apprenticeship model. Can you kind of break down the difference for people who aren't familiar with apprenticeships programs and oh, how sure. those work? Well, the biggest and most important difference is everyone gets paid. So everybody at the very beginning of the program, this isn't like they have to do some kind of like pre-work and then whatnot. It's like, no, as soon as we, they apply, we identify that this is a candidate that we believe will be successful in the industry. Then we hire them. They get paid at this point, a minimum of 18 to $20 an hour. And then once they get hired, the first thing they do is go through our bootcamp curriculum. So they're getting paid to go through something that normally costs $15,000 and we don't charge anything for it. Then there's no weird contracts where we're like, you have to work with for us for two years and then you got to work at this employer. There's none of that. It's just, we trust and invest in somebody, give them three to four months of training first, and then place them embedded inside a uh, engineering team. And it's usually with uh, outside party, right? Sometimes we take the project, but usually it's a project the company is managing. And it really gives them, you know, another you know, eight months or so of hands-on uh, experience every day. And so the difference between a boot camp and an apprenticeship is that you get a job from day one with an apprenticeship. It's really like your job to lose. We do all of the career services and sort of like match them up with employers. And then most of the employers will make a hiring decision to bring that person on. If they can, if they have the capacity, they will, they'll hire the individual. So that's like, from the standpoint of a student, those are some of the most important outcome metrics, right? Is like how many students get jobs within six months? In our case, a hundred percent of them get jobs in month zero, the first month. And then in addition to that, we have very low attrition rates. So we just lost somebody yesterday and it was just like heartbreaking. It was the worst president's day ever because yeah. as you can imagine, it's like, I'm putting everything out there, laying everything on the line. And then when someone's just kind of like, yeah, and they give like sort of like really weird reason why they're like leaving the space. It's pretty disappointing. But that's only happened three times in the last year. We used to have three people drop from every cohort. Like that was just a normal occurrence. But it still hurts every single time. It's still like, man, I could have helped this person get this amazing career. And like, man, it's tough. But it's much fewer and further in between. The number of people that drop out of a, of a coding bootcamp and don't get a job is somewhere around like 20, 25 to 28% for most programs. Hey. So that's a big, wow. that's a big difference. That's a big Delta. Okay. Real quick. How many students do you typically have? Like, do you have cohorts? If so, how many students do you typically have like in a single cohort? So we're still in that first year and a half or so. So we start with a really small cohorts of one or two people. And we've okay. always done rolling cohorts. So from the very beginning, when we were running a program at San Diego Code School, that's actually what I brought to origin was like this rolling cohort. And then we've kept it going since then. So we will start batches as soon as there's demand in the marketplace, we'll start a batch of students. And it could be as small as two students. It could be as large as right now we're putting together 10 person cohort. I'd love to get to the point where we're doing 10 a month, but we're not quite there yet. 
Nice. Okay. And then how long, I know you said they're rolling cohorts, but how long is like the front end part of it? Like where they're just purely training and learning and working on problems before they get placed at an actual employer? Three to four months. It's typical. Okay. But just like we did with, with, uh, all the previous programs I've been involved in, I understand one of the other really difficult challenges for people is keeping up inside of the program. Not everybody learns everything at exactly the same pace. And so we've built flexibility into like every program that I've been part of. So it's like, even though it's an eight week program, we never kick anybody out at week eight. If they need until week 12 to get the material and get it under their belt and graduate, it's like, cool. Right. You know, it does, they're already in, doesn't harm us. And we're doing rolling cohorts. So it doesn't harm us to have more people in the classroom. That would be really problematic yeah. if we were doing traditional, like back to back where everybody goes to the cohort. And then you try to get everybody placed all at the same time and free up all of those seats for like another class that's going to come through. But because we've broken it down that way, we've always been able to like solve for that problem, which is an individual that falls just a little bit behind. It needs a little bit more time to get to the finish line. Cool. So, man, um, I'm really excited about this model because to me, this makes the most sense. Like hands down people. I think you, you guys are really eliminating like the barriers to entry for every other solution that's out there. Because, I mean, if you look at college, a lot of times people from black and brown communities don't go to college because they have financial responsibilities at home with their family. So getting paid 18 to $20 an hour, that is like probably the highest paying like um, retail or like no experience job you can get. So I'm thinking about somebody that's like fresh out of high school or even went to a community college for a couple of years and they say, hey, I want to get into tech. I mean, I don't know of any jobs out there that really, number one, pay you to learn and then number two, pay you. 18 to 20 dollars an hour so i think it's phenomenal what you guys are doing my biggest question is like how can this be more widely adopted and who are some of the employers or partners that you guys typically work with to accomplish your mission okay so the first one is it's going to take some time i'm the most impatient individual that exists but i have now settled into the fact that like if you if we look at how this opportunity is created, it's created by employer demand, right? Everything has to be centered on employer demand because otherwise you're just training for the sake of training people and it's not going to result in jobs. But if we start with our employers willing to hire early career people, the answer is yes. And it's traditionally been like only if they have a year of experience or if they have a year of experience, plus they know our tech stack. But more recently, they have been more receptive to hiring people that are coming out of these immersive coding boot camps. And especially with like how difficult it is to hire right now at this moment during COVID, right? And so what we have to do in order to expand this opportunity and make it available for more people is get more enterprise organizations willing to participate and willing to say, hey, we'll hire from this pipeline. We will support. The vast majority of the revenue that we take in to operate this program is from fee-based services. We've created a model where this money isn't coming from the participants for sure. Like they're not paying anything. They're getting paid. It's actually coming from these engagements we have with enterprise organizations that have the capacity and they have millions of dollars they spend every year bringing on new employees. It's just usually they're coming from a four-year CS degree institution, right? And so they have recruiters. They have whole teams of recruiters that just go to those campuses and recruit on those campuses. Imagine if that wasn't necessary. We didn't need those six people that you're sending to that campus to do that recruiting and to track all of those candidates. And instead you took even some of that money and reinvested it in a different pathway. And so it really is convincing employers and letting them see the material results of our effort that are going to drive more companies to emulate it and say, oh, well, we see IBM is doing it. And so the problem is like the people that have been doing it for the longest are like IBM. And a lot of organizations don't see themselves as like, well, we're not IBM, right? And so we can't even think about doing the things that they're doing. But then when it trickles down and over to, you know, Amazon and Amazon run theirs, Microsoft has been running one for a really long time. And it starts becoming more and more like, oh man, all of the big dogs in this industry are doing this. Maybe we should try and do, you know, let's try and run with the big dogs, right? And then it starts to trickle more and more down to small and medium-sized businesses that are just like... We can't do a class of 10, but maybe we can do a class of two. Maybe we can take our summer internship program and turn that into an apprenticeship. What would that look like? But the most common thing that I experience when I go and I talk to an enterprise is like a lack of awareness. 
the same way people that are listening to this right now might be like, oh man, this is an amazing thing. Most organizations, the people that are on the DEI team, the HR team, the operations team, no idea what apprenticeship is. Zero. Mm -hmm. In fact, I will often say when they're like, what do you do? I was like, oh, I run this registered apprenticeship program. And they're like, oh, that's cool. You do internships. And I'm like, no, bro. I didn't say yeah, that. I, did. <laughs> I did not say that word. <laughs> yeah. But in their mind, because they don't have that mental model of an apprenticeship versus an internship, all they can mm -hmm. think of is the word has a ship in it. And so they're like, oh, they should be <laughs> talking about the summer internship thing, right? And like, they yeah. have no reference for it. That's what it will take for this to just like catch on like fire. And I hope that that happens sooner rather than later, right? My hope is that like sometime, you know, in the next few months, there's just this huge push and everybody's just like in the same direction. We're all going to start apprenticeship programs. Man, I mean, I think that would be great. So by no means, I think this is something that we need to like bottle and brand and have only the, you know, CCC way of doing things. I would love to see more people doing that and create more of this as an opportunity for folks. Yeah. Um, likewise, man, I would love to see that as well. And I mean, right now we hear about all these employers that are having problems finding um, skilled technical workers like software engineers and so on and so forth. And I even heard about Amazon raising their uh, their salaries, I think, to like 200,000, like their their max salaries. They they I'm thinking almost doubled it or something like that. Ridiculous. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is like a logical solution where these companies that have billions and billions of profit, they can make these investments in students and in early career talent and really help build their own ingrown talent and build a pipeline themselves. And, they, and the thing is they can make it as diverse as they want it to be too. Right. So, I mean, I think that that's amazing. I think you guys are really onto something. Quick question. So you're in San Diego. Um, I'm in Houston. I would love to see something like this happen in Houston. Like what are your plans to expand outside of the San Diego market? Or do you have plans to expand? No, no. Oh, great question. Um, we are definitely expanding. We have hired people in other states before, and it's really comes down to the individual. Um, our customer is really the business. So businesses have to say, Hey, we're looking for people that can work anywhere. And then it's like, all right, game on. Now I can hire for anywhere in the country. Um, or they will say, no, we need somebody that's in like in the Houston area. So we would like you to recruit some folks that are specifically, you know, geographically located there. And the good news is we can train remote, so we can train people that are in Houston. So what it takes to get this opportunity in a city like Houston is just the appetite from local businesses. And so if there was a, if there was a person that just want to get out there and hustle and grind for it and be like, hey, I know some folks that I think would be interested in doing this. If they pointed someone in our direction and said, hey, these folks can help you do this, we could send something up very quickly. Now we do have some of our some of our corporate clients are kind of big, and so they have presences everywhere. So an example would be, uh, we have a client, ServiceNow, and ServiceNow has offices like all throughout the country. And they've said, hey, look, we want to pilot something with you. And so when I say, okay, well, geographically, do you have any constraints on where people need to be? They're like, anywhere there's a, a ServiceNow office. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to hear, right? So, you know, we do um, have a project with Becca Dickinson, Intuit. Um, we partner with Microsoft on some things. So like we have some really large organizations that have footprints that are sort of like s spread out, which can provide for a faster response to be able to build something in like a cluster in a particular place. I grew up in Boston originally, so I'm pushing for Boston. That way I get a chance to go back <laughs> and visit my family, you know, have to, Hey, gotta go back East, you know, go check out yeah. business. Right. So to me, it's all about also serving various communities where I know there are people that could, to, to your point, you know, $16, $18 an hour, that could be a game changer for that person. And so if we can bring that to, you know, promise zones across the country, oh man, nothing would make me happier. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. What's a day in the life like for a student that's in the apprenticeship program? Are they, and then also, are they doing like a 40 hour a week commitment? Yeah. So I'll talk about that last one. It is a 40 hour a week job. So a full-time position. Um, but it also has, you know, medical and dental, and we've got um, PTO and paid holidays. We had all day yesterday. So um, I would say the day would typically, if they're in the training phase, so if they're not the beginning, that learning phase, the very beginning, the day is pretty much like it is for most immersive coding boot camps, right? Come in, 
you've got some lecture material that you've got to go through. You've got some coding problems that you got to work through. You got a project that you're going to be building and working on. And so there's a lot of that rinse and repeat. Once they get out of that training phase though, and they get into the, on the job portion, then it's going to be really like you're embedded on a software engineering team. So a lot of the same daily activities. We have an all hands meeting every morning. So the entire team gets together and meets, um, as an organization. And then they might have to go off and they might have to do a stand up with the team that they're working on. And so stand up process is just talking about what you worked on yesterday, anything you're working on today, and then blockers that you have. They will usually be involved in some uh, planning sessions. And so they might have to attend some, you know, design and architecture meetings. And then they'll kind of work through their queue of work. Typically folks will have either a sprint or they'll have a, a board of tasks that you can just kind of pull things off that board and work on them. And occasionally the monotony of the day is, is broken up by uh, lunch, right? And uh, maybe some additional meetings that you've got to go through but a lot of reviewing other people's code, writing some of your own code. And then there may be an end of day, you know, stand up, but it's, it's really client specific at that point. We want the experience to feel like, and it is like you're working inside of a normal software engineering team. So all of the daily activities that would take place are going to be, you know, um, part of the course, normal day to day. Are you comfortable saying what the investment is that a company has to make in this program, like per student, if they're willing to support it? Yeah. So the cost per student is about, I forget what it is in, individually, but a three person team is about $25,000 a month. And then okay. um, the way we break that down, it's very straightforward. So like, this isn't anything that we're shy about. We charge, at this point, we charge $50 per hour per person. And so there's a little margin there between if we're paying somebody 18 to $20 an hour and we're charging roughly $50 an hour, the Delta is what it takes to run this program and break even. So we're not a for-profit, so we're not trying to like gouge anybody and we're not trying to like, uh, we don't need a huge war chest of like capital. Instead, we just want to have enough to like expand and continue to grow. And so those numbers I think are fairly reasonable. I think from the organizational standpoint, in many cases, they're paying way more for that talent than what we're charging. So not for a small organization. So a small startup, that might seem kind of pricey. That's like almost around a hundred thousand dollars a year, somewhere around there for participant. Yeah. But for big enterprise organization, that's cheap. Like they're going to easily drop that when they make a decision to hire and bring somebody on. And so for them, this is a great way for them to get a look at a candidate and be able to kind of like try before they buy and support uh, you know, to bring diverse people into the organization. So, so it's a win overall. We'd love to close the gap and we'd love to be able to pay our participants more and potentially charge our clients more. But like, we're just in that first year of like trying to figure out like, is this a model that's sustainable and are there other ways that we could tweak around the edges? But I think from my perspective, that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Real quick. You said there was a three person team. So you mean like three different, uh, trainees or like a trainee and then like a senior level. So usually, and... usually when we'll start a pilot, the smallest pilot we would start with company is probably a three person team. Um, okay. if it's a large organization, it just doesn't make sense to start anything with less than that because they want to be able to like go internally and champion it and say, Hey, we got this, we had this whole team, three people, they came in, they crushed it. It also makes sense that they're going to be training and onboarding people. So they want to kind of make sure that they're doing it in batches, but a lot of our corporate clients, they do it in increments of three, right? So they might say, we want to start with 10 or we want to start with five or three, but it's, it's not usually smaller than three. Although it could be, we can start one person with, with companies when we've had that situation, what we normally do is start two people part-time. If their capacity is like one FTE, we'll say, okay, well, how about if we put two people on part-time? That way, when you're looking to grow and expand, you can just like increase the hours of those two people and we don't have to ramp a completely brand new person up inside your organization. All right. Last question before we move on. What's kind of a day in the life like for you as a CEO of a, a tech startup? Oh, man. It's honestly, I find it, uh, it's a grind and here's why. Because it's nothing like being a software engineer where the thing that you want the most is you want like a distraction free quiet environment where you can stay super heads down and focused. That is not my day. 
My day is literally just being bombarded all day long with various calm fires. And it would be a little fire, you know, like little Zippo, or it'd be like raging fire. And you just got to be like, all right, I need to compartmentalize this. And like all of those raging fires going on, I'm going to finish this call that I'm on with the person and keep smiling and like tapping out messages on my messenger of like what to do. And so like, that's kind of the day. And it's like out of left field, right? Like everything from like HR issues, you know, people deciding that like, well, I thought that this person makes $19 an hour and I only make $18 an hour. And I'm like, you are missing the big picture, folks. <laughs> like, I mean, get your job making like 70 grand. Can you just please be patient? <laughs> right. But yeah, you're dealing with a lot of, you know, like humans and they, their perspective is different. And so we actually did something kind of unique last week where every day of the week at our all hands meeting, I described some aspect of the business to help them better understand a lot of the things that we just kind of do behind the scenes and like never talk about, but like just get done for them so they don't have to stress out. Right. And so, but it's important for it. It's important. We should have done it earlier. Because in the absence of that, they have all these fears and they fear that like, oh man, um, I don't know if I'm going to get a job after this. And like, why would you think that? It's like everybody that's come through is exiting with a job, making a ton of money. Like what would make you think that? Well, you just never talked about it. I'm like, yeah, I never talked about it because all we need to do is celebrate the wins when people get offers. Like you don't have, literally, you don't have to do anything. It's just going to like, one day you'll be working for us. And the next day the employer is going to make you an offer. You get an offer letter and yeah. like for a lot more money. And so it's just like. In my opinion, we never need to talk about it. But I realize that in the absence of that, humans begin to invent all kinds of things when they don't have information to fill in. And it's usually negative. It's usually not like, I'm going to fill in the gaps with like positive things. And so for me, a lot of my day, much more of my day that I'd like to be is filled with that, with helping people understand in the absence of information, don't assume that it's negative, assume the opposite. Like if there's something bad, we'll let you know, but like. That like almost every time, almost a hundred percent of the time, I will have a candidate that's been working on a project for you know a few months come to me and say, "Oh man, I don't know how it's going. I don't know if they're ever going to make an offer to me." And I'm like, "Would you relax?" I talked to them last week, and they were saying they're preparing to make an offer to you. Like, what are you talking about, right? And so, inevitably, it almost always works out that way. Like, right at the moment, the person thinks, "Like, oh man, when am I going to get an offer?" They're already working on the paperwork. It's just like, gotcha. That's awesome. Hey, we're, I don't think you, we talked about it, but what are like the backgrounds of the uh, the candidates that are in your cohort? Are they just fresh out of high school or like returning back to work or what, what's kind of the skill level that they have in the background? Across the spectrum. So we are looking to really get more involved with people that are just graduating from high school, right? I think that that's an awesome opportunity to just, from my perspective, told you how long it took. If I could start at that point, start fresh, then they won't have to go through some of the pain that a lot of people go through where, you know, they not sure what they want to do. So they take a year off and then they go to community college and like their journey is just like really long. That said, we have a lot of people that are transitioning. So they've had a few years of work and they realize that whatever they got their initial degree in or their education is really not where they see themselves in the future. So they want to transition. We do support people that are like returning. So we've had women returning, we've had older gentlemen returning and the idea is like they find themselves in a situation where they're competing against the younger generation of talent and these are folks that you know they might have had a cs degree they might have graduated from i had a woman who graduated from mit and then spent a while raising her family and then once her last teenager was like off to college she was like okay i'm ready to return and so she actually went through our program when we we're still at the santa Cruz school she paid her you know 2500 bucks we got her into like an amazing company here locally, Walmart Labs, right? So um, Walmart Labs, you know, they're doing stuff at, at web scale. They're selling like just like Amazon, like huge uh, volumes of e-commerce. And like that to me was the like, perfect scenario, right? Someone came in, refreshed their skills, got what they did to be successful, and we helped them make that connection. Again, man, I, I applaud all the work you're doing. I think you're doing some great things. And I think you guys are really developing a blueprint that can be copied um, by anybody really across the country. So I really hope that people do heed your advice and look at the model that you guys are creating and then try to duplicate that. You know, I think I think there's some great things that you're doing there. Um, but let's move on to the next section. Uh, next segment, I should say, uh, it's called Factor Cap. 
This is a new segment that we've added. It's basically truth or false. So if you feel like the statement is true, say facts. If you feel like the statement is false, say cap. Um, but try to answer factor cap and then give a very brief description in 60 seconds or less for each question. All right. All right. I will do my best. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's factor cap. First one. According to Glassdoor.com, the average salary for a software engineer in San Diego is about $108,000. Factor cap. Facts. But I think it's important to recognize everybody doesn't start there because it's an average salary. That means people will start below and then people will work their way up above. And I think it's reasonable for people to believe that in a year or two, you'll be over $100,000 for sure. All right. Nice. Next one. Uh, factor cap. You need to be good at math in order to be a software engineer. Cap. Because I don't consider uh, the level of math that's needed for you to be pretty good all that difficult. Like I went through calculus in college. You know what calculus is. As long as you got like algebra, algebra one, maybe even a little bit of algebra two, so you can understand, uh, then you're going to be good. Cool. All right. Next one. Factor cap. College should be free. Cap. I'm not in the, it should be free. I think everybody should have access to it and access to the ability to um, finance it. But there, when you say free, money's going to come from somewhere. And if you want to be a quality education, then we got to have some ability to like fund it. All right. Next one. Uh, factor cap. JavaScript is the most important programming language to learn. Facts. I bias also share that I'm the president of the annual JavaScript community. So, okay. Um, a little bias, but for web development, I think it's a great place to enter. And so I think if you're thinking about software engineering, it's great to start with web development and JavaScript is going to be the bread and butter in web development. Okay. Next one. Factor cap. It's not what you know, but who you know that matters. So network is more important than your skills. Facts. Yeah. You gotta be able to get out there. And that's one of the things that people have the biggest. I don't want to say people, I'd say the majority of folks have a hard time with that because they're more comfortable with numbers and coding, and they're maybe not as comfortable with like selling themselves and talking about how they can be successful. Um, so yeah, they, they gotta learn that that's an important aspect of what in that first job. All right. Awesome. Great job, man. All right. So we're going to move into our last segment. This is all about professional development. Um, so we're going to be talking about salary, salary negotiation and LinkedIn and things of that nature. Sure. Um, things that would basically help your uh, people that are in your apprenticeship program. So number one, what is the typical soft, what is the typical salary that you've seen people make after they've left your apprenticeship program? Last year was averaging around 67 and this year is averaging closer to around 77 in that range. Nice. Do you have any experience with salary negotiations? And if so, what advice would you give for others? Uh, I do. I don't give a lot of advice for people that are negotiating uh, at the entry level because there's not a lot of margin. So a couple of tips that I'll tell people is, and these may be obvious to some folks, but it goes without saying, if nobody's ever heard it before, then they should know. If, you, if you're a little shy about throwing a number out there and saying like, this is kind of where I'd like to be at in a certain number, then what you can do is give them a range and you can say, I'd like to be at 65 to 70, but always remember that when you give them a range, they're almost always going to pick the lower number of the range. So make sure the lower number of the range is where you want to be. The other piece of advice I'll just generally say about negotiating a salary is it is not true that you can just throw any number out there as a starting number, um, and, sh and aim high and hope that like, that's going to be successful because if you aim too high then what you're communicating to the person that you're talking to who doesn't know you very well is that you are a crazy person that like you can't be negotiated with because you're insane. Like then there's no reasoning with you if the number is too high. So it does have to be in the range of something that's reasonable. So you should do your, your homework and make sure you understand what is reasonable in the market that you're in right now. We're in this weird market where like it's the whole country, right? But they will probably take into consideration where you live and the cost of living where you live and understand that like when they hire people in your region, this is kind of the range that they will usually make offers at. Those are, those are my salary negotiation tips. Um, the one other thing that people will ask is like <clears throat> when they make an offer, 
is it okay to go back and ask for more? Sure. If you feel like the offer that they've made um, doesn't represent where you think you need to be at. But I always caution folks that like, you can, you can ask for another, like, hey, I'd really like to be at this number. Like, they, let's say they make you an offer and it's at, it's at 70 and you'd like to be at like 75. You can say, hey, I'd, I'd, like, I'd really, this is a generous offer. I appreciate it. I'd really like to be at 75. That simple, you know, we'll throw it out there on the table and see what they say. If they come back and they say, offer stands at 70, then you have to start being reasonable and thinking like that $5,000 difference that you're like in your head and you're stuck on, think about how much of a difference that is per paycheck over the course of a year and recognize that over the course of a year, if you do a really good job, you can go back to them and say, Hey, I'd really like to be at 75 and they'll probably make it up and some and give you promotion. So it's such a small number that I wouldn't get stuck on it. Great advice. What advice would you give for others who are struggling to figure out what career path to take? I would say try software engineering. Because if you try it and you don't like it, you still might be good enough, good enough at it that you can do it while you're trying to find your passion. Right. So throughout the pandemic, I learned how to play the drums. Not super well, but like I can play a little bit. Yeah. I think a lot of people go into this job thinking like, or going to this career path, thinking that like, I have to be really good at it. And this is going to be like my, you know, this is my living. And and it's like, but you don't say that about like retail. You don't say that about like, um, working in fast food. You don't say like, this is where I'm always going to be for the rest. So like, think of it as a much better paying thing vehicle that you can do during the day and be good at, be competent. I'm not saying be shoddy, but you can be competent at it, but your real passion could be, you know, surfing, whatever the, you know, whatever you're into. And this could just be a great way for you to earn a living. I think it's way too many people well, like trying to wrap everything up. Like I, my job has to be my mission in life. It's like maybe <laughs> eventually you'll get there. So that's, that's what I would encourage people to think about is like, Hey, start with web development. When in doubt, start with web development because you can earn a really good living and then you can kind of find out if you really like it. And then maybe you want to work on backend services. Maybe you want to become a data engineer. Maybe you want to move into, you know, ops or sec ops. And like, there's a lot of just pathways that you can take. This is brilliant advice. I, I've talked to high school students before and they're trying to figure out, do they want to go to college? What do they want to major in if they do go to college? And it's always comes down to, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I'm like, dude, I'm 30 and I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. So you don't have to have it all planned out and figured out right at 18 or 17. Just kind of pick a good starting point. And I, I think what you said is brilliant. So next question. So you have quite a following on LinkedIn. I think you have like over 10,000 followers on, on LinkedIn currently. And LinkedIn to me is like one of the best like networking tools that are out there. What advice would you give for others who are looking to grow their LinkedIn? And then also, can you just speak in general to the power of LinkedIn in your experience? Oh, yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is a game changer. And the reason why is because there's never been a time previously, previous to like now and LinkedIn, that someone like me that like comes from these like humble beginnings and is just beginning my like, you know, CEO journey, been a CEO for uh, like three, four years now, right? But um, I can connect with somebody that has years of industry experience and like that uh, medium, that ability to be able to like, sort of like be in a room that you normally wouldn't be in. And just that it, it doesn't always work this way. Like you can reach out to somebody and like, they might just like completely ignore you and like you never get there. But it's just interesting sometimes that you can find yourself in a room that you don't really belong in, right? Like you're yeah. way above your pay grade. And then you'd be amazed that the number of times I've reached out and be like, Hey, can we grab lunch? And they're like, yeah, sure. I'll have my like executive assistant reach out to you and like, we'll put something together. Like these are people that like, they don't even book the lunch. Like someone's going to book the lunch for them. So that to me is like the amazing power of LinkedIn that it can literally break down those like barriers that would prevent you from being able to connect with people. And so you can increase your social capital really quickly on LinkedIn. And I would say people should be doing that for the positive, for good. And uh, yeah, it's just interesting. Like one of the funnest things that that I find is that because I've connected with certain people in certain spaces, other people will look at the profile and be like, oh, that's interesting what that dude's doing. And they'll just like connect with me. 
And I'm connected with like people that, like I said, I get no business being connected to, right? <laughs> um, everything from like NBA and NFL folks. Um, my favorite one recently is Bo Jackson. Well, hey, let me try and connect with Bo Jackson. Well, I don't know if he accepted it. And so I was like, and you, so you know, Bo, you know, 30 years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Bo. But I had his shoes and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody from like, you know, Matter World Peace, I was like, he was one of the like first NBA guys that I like reached out to that I was like, oh man, like he actually connected with him. And I run in the room and tell my wife, guess who I'm connected to, right? And so, <laughs> it, but it's like, it doesn't guarantee that you'll have the time or you'll ever conversate with a person or, but it like does mean that there might be something that we'll eventually see. And one day that might make a connection and they're like, hey, look, I'm doing some things out in LA. I'd love for you to be a part of it. Or they might ask technical questions and like, they might be like, Hey, I'm working on this product. What do you think mm -hmm. about this thing? And then suddenly now you're in the room and you have a chance to like have a conversation with somebody that like, otherwise this is like very in like very infrequent that you'd have that opportunity. Hey, that's, that's a great point, man. Great point. 10 years ago, how would you get in contact with Meta World Peace? How would you find his email or Bo Jackson? Like it's completely changed the game. Well, they're the, calling, but coach, emailing, still, but it's still possible for people that would hustle, right? So if you were a hustler, you would show up yeah. to the game and you'd wait outside the locker room for hours and hours, right? All that yeah. work now is gone because all you need to do now is hit connect, right? But it, before you had to hustle, you had to show up someplace where someone that you wanted to meet was going to be. <laughs> yep. Uh, one quick follow-up question. How do you, what, what piece of advice do you give for others who maybe are trying to like make connections with people on LinkedIn? Like, do you have anything like a best practice that you do for reaching out to somebody that you don't know? Yeah, I try and uh, keep it short because folks on LinkedIn tend to, well, well the first thing I, I'd say is the don't make the mistake that I think a lot of people make, which is like they send this really long message with like, uh, what do you think I should do with my career? And it's just like, yeah. yo, Bo Jackson doesn't have time to give you career advice off the jump, right? First time you talk to him, right? So like you should make it super simple and like one or two sentences, right? Hey, my name is Andrew. I run a podcast. I like to highlight people that are making a real big impact. Is this something you'd be interested in? Cause then all they have to do is answer yes or no. And if they answer yes, they'll probably be like, yes, send me an email and they'll give you their email address. And so you've made it really easy to facilitate making taking action for that individual. So try and think action oriented. What is the action that you'd actually want them to take? So like when I connect with folks, sometimes I just connect with them because I just think it's like interesting. I want to see them on the feed. And so I'll just like hit connect, connect with them. Other times it's like, okay, my first step is just to connect because eventually I know I will have an ask. So I can't tell you the number of times I try to connect with Obama and, you know, Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> right. But none yet, but I keep trying. I'll keep, I'll take it back after three weeks or so. And then a month Ew. later, I'll put the request in again and be like, come on, Obama. You, come on, man. You Shoot your shot, man. things together, right? Hey, for real. So, um, quick question. Do you send a, do you send a connection with a, a note or do you just send a message first? Typically. Depends. Depends how I'm feeling that day. Okay. Cause I would say you right, get a 50, 50 cool. shot either way. Well, well, let me take that back. I have a 50, 50 shot either way because. I've got enough on my profile where someone can look at it and they can know why I'm connected. They're like, oh, this guy's gotcha. doing things and like, this is what he's doing. And so what I want them to do when I hit that connect and I don't put a message, I want them to go my profile and I want them to look at the profile and see what I'm doing and really make a decision based on what I'm doing. If, if they want to be in my network and if it makes sense for them and they want to like, remember, oh yeah, there's that coding guy. Like I gotta, now I gotta reach out to him because now I have a reason. And that's all we're trying to do is just make that introduction so that when the time is right, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate and do something that's going to make an impact for, you know, maybe millions of people at some point. So if you don't have like a, just like crazy amount of experience on your page and like a super uh, clear call to action of, or purpose, why they would want to connect with you, then I do think you need that one or two sentence introduction where you need to say, this is who I am. This is what I do. Is this interesting to you? Dope. So we got a couple more questions before sure. we wrap up. Um, so this next question, if you had to, I want you to think about one resource that's really helped you throughout your career. And by resource, I mean like scholarship, uh, certification, a conference you attended, or even just a piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor or a colleague or a friend. Um, but if you had to 
give one piece of advice or one recommendation for others, what would that be? That's a good question. It's not certifications. I can tell you that for sure. I thought that was what it was going to be. I thought certifications were going to be like my gateway. I was going to get that cert. I was going to get a job. Um, I guess the one piece of advice I would give, it's not a person. It's not a thing. I think the, the game changer for me was when I began to feel confidence that like, I got this, I can do this because before that I wasn't really eager to try things out that I thought I might fail at. And as soon as I started figuring out that like, you can try it. And if you fail, you just fail. No one knows. Just try again. Like just do it again. Mm -hmm. Just pick yourself up and try it again. And so exactly. that's the one that kind of clicked for me when, uh, I went through the whole thing with origin. So it took me 40 years to figure that out. Right. I wish I had experimented and tried things much earlier on, but like most growing up in a, in a black household, most of us are encouraged to do things that are safe because there's already enough risks and challenges and things you don't already have to deal with. So like, don't do anything else crazy. That's why our parents don't want us to be ball players or musicians or all these things that are like super exciting to young folks. Right. And young folks are like, oh man, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Yeah. And then your parents are just like, would you go to school and like get good grades so that you have some opportunities <laughs> and they're not trying exactly. to be dream crushers, but they're just trying to like be practical and pragmatic. And sometimes too much of that kind of, kind of shines too. Software engineering is, it is an area where it's like, this is a great fallback, right? Great fallback is software engineering. And then you can be working on, you have all this extra time to work on your true passions. If it's not software engineering. Man, that's amazing. So one last question, uh, before we wrap up, um, and this is like our big picture question that we ask all of our guests and you've kind of already created an answer to this quick question, but I'll still ask it. But if you can implement one change or do one thing to get more people of color to pursue uh, STEM or technology careers, what is that one thing, whether it's a policy change or um, a habit or anything at all, what would you create or what would you make in order to get more diverse people into tech? I think the biggest challenge right now is one that I'm bumping up against now. I'm creating a ton of opportunity in the space. And I'm kind of like, all right, now I get to man. I get these like folks that are just like, like urgently saying, okay, where are the developers? Like you said, you're going to give us the developers. Where are the developers at? And then I turn to my community and I'm like, Hey, I'm training folks for free. And folks are like, what's software engineering? I'm just like, Oh man, there's not enough of us in the space that everybody gets it. And everybody understands the opportunity. I mean, everybody has, you know, cell phone. I don't know where mine is. I was about to pick it up and put it in the screen, but everybody yeah. has a cell phone, everybody's a consumer but not enough of us are creators and producers of digital content. And so I think the change that needs to happen is there needs to be much, much more. I don't want to say digital literacy, but like awareness of all of these career paths at a much earlier uh, phase in the black and brown communities so that they are in their brain thinking, not just like, I want to grow up and I want to be a doctor, nurse, dentist, the things that they know people can be successful at. Yeah. athlete musician like they in their brain they think that's success success is all of those career paths but they don't think like success is i it could live in the dream at like netflix and like not just watching netflix but like building netflix and i could be making two hundred thousand dollars a year and imagine what that lifestyle would be like you know working as a software engineer and coming into the office at these nice offices Getting, I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the interview or not the interview, the, the internship with, uh, you know, those two white dudes, but. Oh yeah. The comedians, uh, yeah. at Google. Yeah. It's like that. You walk in and it's like, you know, free breakfast and lunch every day, catered breakfast and lunch yeah. every day and dogs in the office running around acting crazy in like the gaming <laughs> rooms and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, people don't have a, they don't have a mental picture of that, of like, that's an option It's like, one of the things that you could do as a job is like, you could show up. And you can see even these white dudes are just like, wait, I can get as many of these pieces of fruit. Okay. I'm going to take a couple more. I can take as many of these bagels as I want. Can I get, yeah. like, make a six, right? Until they have that in their brain and they can see that that's actually a real thing. They're making fun of it because it's a real thing. 
if you haven't seen that movie and you don't know any software engineers, then you have no concept of that, like that dream for you to have, right? That's what I want more of more opportunity is to implant that dream into young folks to be able to say, okay, now I use this to make sure that you can get your basic reading and math skills when you're in high school. And then you're out. How do you want to make that dream materialize? Do you want to go for your institution? Do you want to go to an HBCU? Do you want to go to a coding boot camp? Do you want to go through an apprenticeship program? But like, they don't even have the dream. They don't have the vision yet. That's what we need to have more of our community is like really understand that dream. Man, preach. Yeah, I can't say it no better than that. Now, I think that dream is really important because if you don't know, like, what you're striving for, how are you going to go after it? Like, you, you got to see it to believe it and then know, okay, this is what I'm working towards. I think you're right. I think you hit the nail right on the head. Like, more of us need to know what options are out there. We have to start at a younger age. So um, I think that's a brilliant answer. Man, for everybody out there, please go follow this man on LinkedIn. It's a yeah. force creating coding careers, like doing amazing things. Um, we're talking about paid jobs, getting paid to learn. And um, I'm going to tell you real quick, that's the reason why I got my master's degree. Uh, my supervisor was like, yo, I'll pay you to do a master's degree. And I was like, you're going to pay me to learn. I was like, all right, well, why would I not? This college is cool. I like being in college. I'm getting paid to learn. I'll do it. But I mean, you're doing something really revolutionary in my book, 18 to $20 an hour. People get paid full time with benefits, health benefits. That's crazy. Um, so I'm thinking about the kid that's growing up on the, uh, in our case, on the east side of town, not making a lot of money or any money, um, families just above the poverty line. I think that what you're doing can really help change a lot of lives and really help change the black and brown communities that we, we come from. Um, last thing, do you want to give any shout out or any plug, anything else? I know you, or how can people follow or find creating, co creating coding careers? Our website is ccareers.org. So there's three C's in there. And then, uh, follow me on, uh, LinkedIn. That's a great way to kind of like keep in touch and figure out like when we're actually doing a big hiring spree. Um, but yeah, I would love to have more people go to our website and apply, right? Doesn't require much. You got a high school diploma or a GED. You're eligible to work here in the U S you qualified. Doesn't require you to have any you know, previous coding experience. So I'd love to have more people just like throw their application in there and helping us to make it happen in those regions and various communities across the country. Awesome. Yeah, we got we got to talk after this goes off. We got to figure out a way how to get you in Houston. I got some students in mind, um, but Wait. we got to talk and see, hey, how can we make this happen? Awesome. So, all right, Mike, man, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Um, for everybody that's watching, thank you all for watching. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find us on Apple and uh, Spotify. Um, and then also you can check us out online at Custom Journeys or on Instagram at Custom Journeys. That's at C-U-S-T-E-M journeys j-o-u-r-n-e-y-s uh so that's at custom journeys on instagram or at cu or custom journeys.com online so thank you all for watching been a great time take care and we'll see you next week